and we'll get this shit going. So, uh, uh, hello from Boston, missing good old Canada. Oh, awesome. Well, it sounds like we've got a really lively bunch here and I'm very excited about today's talk. Um, so thank you everyone for, I mean, first and foremost for coming and um, checking it out. Um, this talk is something that I've definitely been wanting to chat about because it's a new and exciting area, I believe, and really could be a pretty big game changer in the terms of um, weight management and obesity management. So without further ado, let us dive right into it. Uh, and I will ask that all questions, we save them to the end. You can just put them into like the Q&A box or the chat box. And I promise you, we will get the, to them at the end. This is a bit longer of a slot or a, a presentation. So I want to kind of just chunk through it and just be mindful of everybody's time the best that we can. But certainly I will have time for um, questions afterwards. All right. So. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan, or Dr. Dan is what my patients and clients affectionately call me. Um, I'm a pharmacist turned weight management specialist, and I am the founder of Healthcare Evolution. Um, I've been doing these webinar presentations for a few months now. We had a bit of a break over the summer, just because obviously it's nice out, and not even I wanted to sit behind a computer or anything. So we took a little break, and uh, this is our first presentation being back. Um, and so, yeah, so this will be kicking it off, and we'll probably do this right through until uh, almost next next summer. So it'll be kind of every summer uh, or every every month um, until next summer. Some of these events um, will be uh, paid events. Some of them will be free. I'm kind of trying to find a nice balance there to kind of provide and also make back on some of my time and stuff like that. But nonetheless, putting the knowledge and information out there. And um, yeah, if you guys ever have any ideas for topics, I mean, feel free at any point in time to reach out and let me know what your thoughts are. So let me just move this up. Um, a few of my disclosures here, I would just like to point these out just to say, you know, if there's any affiliates or anything that I mentioned. Um, at the present time, I am not affiliated with any drug company in particular. Um, I do work at a pharmacy here in Calgary. I am the clinical director of an aesthetics clinic. And I sit on a couple of advisory boards and um, do various other things. I'm pretty sure this isn't even a complete list, but here's the rough idea for you. Um, as I stated, I am recording this event. Now we do it for promotional purposes. These videos do get loaded up onto YouTube. So if for whatever reason you have to leave or want to go back to it at any point in time, um, this webinar will be up on the, on the YouTube channel there. And um, it will yeah, be available and you can watch it at any point in time and, and review any parts that you'd like to go over as well. Um, just to mention that any name identifying info will be removed before things are put up or being used in a ad, Instagram post, you name it. All right, so a quick review of the learning objectives. Basically, I wanna go over what energy balance actually is. We'll discuss metabolic adaptation, the role in weight management, and then postulate the future of obesity management. So quick and easy overview for you. Um, I'm sure many of you that have been in this space for a while have heard the calories in, calories out dogma idea, if you will. So this is basically the basic laws of thermodynamics that when the calories that are going into your body are the same as the calories that you are burning or the calories that are going out, you will maintain your weight. When the calories in are greater than the calories going out, you will gain weight. And when the calories going in are less than what the calories that are going out, you will lose weight. So this is fundamental law of thermodynamics. We can't get around it. We can't, um, you know, certain conditions don't alter it, change it, anything like that. Um, this formula or the structure of the formula, there are things that affect obviously the calories that are going out and can drive our calories going in behaviors and stuff. So just a quick overview, um, calories in are the food we eat. So it's the fuel that we take in, the food, alcohol, beverages, that is all of the calories that are going in. Those are the things that cause our calorie intake um, to go up for the day. Whereas calories out is made up of a number of different components. Um, so we have our total daily energy expenditure, which is kind of the overarching how many calories we burn in a day. And this is called your TDEE. -E. And it's made up of all the other components here. Our basal metabolic rate, this is sometimes called the resting metabolic rate. There's a slight difference between the two, but for our purposes, they're pretty much the same thing. 
basically this is just to keep the proverbial lights on, right? So keep your heart beating, keep the digestive organs going, all the stuff that happens in the background that you don't need to think about. This is essentially your basal metabolic rate. NEAT is your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So any daily activities that you do. So, you know, I just got done at work, just done in clinic, um, you know, doing some stuff around the house, you're fidgeting, just moving about, how much you kind of tap your foot and that sort of thing. Those are all gonna play into this. Now, the big thing with the NEAT is that it doesn't include your sleeping, eating or formal activities. And this is where the other parts will come into it here. So EAT is your ec exercise activity thermogenesis. So this is going to basically be any kind of formal activity, um, exercise, you name it. If you go to the gym, if you go for a walk, even if you get up at the office and walk around the office for a couple of laps or something like that, basically anything that's an intentional activity or something like that, that's going to be the uh, calories that you burn during that activity. And then finally, there's the thermic effect of food. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but the food that you take in, it requires energy to be broken down, digested, and absorbed. And our body will, will use up energy to do that. And another point for protein, everyone knows that I'm a big protein fan and think more people should eat of it or get more of it, but protein takes considerably more energy to break down and utilize by the body compared to carbohydrates and fat. So here's kind of a breakdown of the over R if we look at our total daily expenditure and how many calories we burn. Obviously the 40% is gonna be this thermic effect, exercise and NEAT, um, the NEAT and stuff like that. Um, are going to be life, partly lifestyle dependent, but also genetically determined. So how much you fidget, how much you move around, how anxious of an individual you are, those are all going to be potentially determined by um, partly by genetics. Now your basal metabolic rate, that is essentially entirely genetically determined. So whatever you got from mom and dad, that is going to be your basal metabolic rate. And that basal metabolic rate can be affected by certain conditions, hypothyroidism, PCOS, and that sort of thing. And I'm just going to turn the window down here. Okay, so our goal is to lose weight, but what does that actually look like? Well, first and foremost, it's not just a matter of reducing carbs or reducing fat or whatever newfangled diet is being pushed out there. It's about reducing your calories in. If your calories in are less than your calories going out, you're going to create that calorie deficit and you're going to lose weight. And a lot of people would love to see the nice linear line going down like this, but the reality of weight loss is it's up and down, up and down. Some days you see spikes, some days it goes down further. It's, it's all over the place. And this is why I always talk to my, my patients and my clients about not getting too wrapped up in the scale. The scale, yes, can give us some information, but it's just a data point because along that, it's going to change on a day-to-day -day basis and it's better to get an overall trend as to what's going on. So at first, everything seems wonderful. And then we kind of will start this cycle. Now, I'm sure many of you can relate to this. You know, you do a diet, have great success, lose a bunch of weight, and then you come off the diet and the weight comes back, maybe even then some. So, you know, maybe a month or two, maybe a couple of years down the road, try it again, you lose a bunch of weight and the weight comes back once you come off of it. And it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And this is what we call yo-yo dieting, okay? So really, I love this quote, the best way to gain five pounds is to really lose 20 pounds. Um, it's kind of a common saying that we, we use in the obesity space that, yeah, there is inherent risks that come with trying to lose weight. And it's something we always need to talk about and really setting expectations that right now in a lot of situations, um, a majority of people will gain the weight back that they've lost. And again, it's not necessarily their fault by any means. It's a multitude of different factors. But it is definitely something that we need to be aware of and need to be thinking of um, during this process in terms of managing our weight. So really, what the hell is going on? And I just wanted to show this graph right here, because as you can see, weight loss over time, big dip, you lose a bunch. And then as you even are trying to stay on the diet, whatever it is, you eventually will start to see the weight start to go back up. And the further out that you go, the more the weight that comes back on. Even when we're utilizing things like the Ozempic, Saxenda, Wagovi, you name it, we see a similar pattern. Weight comes down, you plateau for a bit, and then the weight starts going back up. And so it's this common um, hockey stick bent kind of curvish thing that we often see. So why is it happening? So there's a few things that happen when we lose weight. First off, your body decreases the basal metabolic rate. So how much your body just burns on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, it's genetically 
predetermined. But the other thing we need to keep in mind is just that when you start living in a smaller body, you just burn less fuel, right? If the fire is smaller, it's going to use up less fuel. And so fewer calories are going to be burned. One of the big ones that we see, and this is one of the main components that we see when people lose weight, is we see a decrease in meat, in particular, your fidgeting. So if you were someone that fidgeted, moved around a lot and stuff like that, those actions actually get decreased quite significantly. As well, subconsciously, you start trying to find ways to essentially reduce your activity. So I always like to use the example of myself, the nights that I go to the gym, I'm much less inclined to take the stairs up to my fourth floor condo. Instead, I'm much more going to take the, uh, take the elevator. And so, yeah, I did a good workout, maybe got some extra calories there, but I, I'll ultimately negate the whole process of it because now I've taken the elevator when I usually take the stairs. And so those extra calories are no longer being burned. So overall, my meat gets compressed. And that's what we subconsciously do, consciously do. It's kind of a multitude of different factors, but we do see a primary drive and reduced reduction in that respect. Obviously, you get a decrease in the thermic effect of food. If you're eating less food, again, less wood going out of the pile, less calories being burned, and a decrease in your exercise expenditure as well, because as you become smaller, you become more fuel efficient. Same thing with your activity levels. The exercise that you do do, your body just gets better at using what fuel it is given, and so it burns less calories. So all of this, for the most part, makes, makes general sense, right? But there's more. So other things that happen on a physiological level that you really have no control and nothing you can do about is we see an increase in your appetite hormone. So obviously you start losing weight, um, you start getting cravings, your hunger increases. Anybody that's ever restricted any kind of foods will definitely know what I mean by this. Um, you get a decrease in your satiety hormone. So GLP-1, that's the hormone that's, uh, that's in Saxenda and Ozempic. We see a decrease in that hormone. So suddenly you're not getting that fullness after meal. It feels like you need to keep eating, keep eating, keep eating in order to get satisfied essentially. And then again, we see this increase in fuel efficiency. So I talked a little bit about with the exercise component, but your basal metabolic rate will actually drop to a lower rate um, than what would actually be expected based on just a change in body size and that sort of thing. So things just get used more and more and more efficiently. So let's use a little example here. Um, where can I put my little face? We'll put it down here. Um, so this is our expected. So we have a lady here. She was 200 pounds and she lost 40 pounds. Before she lost that weight, her basal metabolic rate was about 1600 calories per day. So that's how many calories her body burned by just existing. Okay. Lost the, th the 40 pounds. She's 160 pounds now. Now, based on just the mathematical calculations, you can type in BMR calculator on Google and a million of them will come up. And what we'll see is that her BMR should be about 1400 calories per day. That's what we would expect it or calculate it to be. However, the reality is, is that she actually has an actual BMR of 1200 calories a day. So it's suddenly 200 calories less than what it should be, but she only lost 40 pounds. So why isn't the math working on this? Well, this is kind of partly because um, she lost weight essentially. So we have a comparison group right here. So we have her and we have the two ladies here, both lost 40 pounds or didn't lose 40 pounds. We have one lady that never lost any weight. She just happened to be 160 pounds. And then we have our lady that did lose the 40 pounds and she's the one that has the reduced metabolic rate. So another lady that is at the exact same height, age and weight, but never lost weight, her metabolic rate is automatically going to be higher than a lady that loses weight that is at the exact same age, height and weight. So expected versus the reality. And it can be up to 15%. It can be actually much higher than that. And we'll get into the evidence around that a little bit. So kind of, a uh, yeah, right. Losing weight and our, our metabolism goes down further than what we want it to. So um, it's, yeah, it's a much greater reduction in your basal metabolic rate or your rest of metabolic rate than what we expected. Obviously, well, is this why maintaining weight loss is so challenging? Like if you're suddenly 200 calories lower than what you should be, yeah, it might be a little bit tricky. It might be harder to maintain your weight because your calorie intake or your calorie burn is much lower all of a sudden. And definitely that's going to cause some um, a pain in the ass essentially because you've got to get into that lower of a calorie deficit in order to not only maintain the weight loss, but to also lose further weight if you were looking for that. So why does our body do this? Primarily, it's survival, right? 30,000 years ago, when we were on the Sahara Desert and 
whatever safaris and jungle and caveman that sort of thing i don't know where i was going with the sahara but anyways um 30 000 years ago losing weight was a bad thing it was an evolutionary disadvantage right that meant that there was either an interruption in the food supply there was a famine going on something bad was happening we had a shortage of food and so our body had mechanisms that could kick in in order to retain as much energy as possible so that we could survive long enough to find food Without this mechanism in place, we wouldn't be here today, essentially. And the animals that you see out in the wilderness wouldn't be here today. And so, and even the animals that you do see that are very skinny or emaciated generally are sick or there is a massive interruption in their food supply. So different things like that, we always need to keep in mind um, that it, it is a survival mechanism, but we just haven't gotten rid of it. So a common... Thing that comes up is is this starvation mode um i hear it all the time in terms of the instagram influencers and tiktok influencers and whoever the idea behind this is that basically when your calories get to a low too low of a point your metabolism just like shuts off altogether and you get too low you suddenly can't lose weight and you're not in a calorie deficit in fact you actually start gaining weight and the reality is is that starvation mode doesn't exist the, the law of thermodynamics doesn't suddenly go out the door because your calories are to such a low point. Um, essentially, if you are gaining weight, you are in a calorie surplus. You are taking in more calories than what you are burning. So it's not starvation mode. You can always get your calories lower and lower and lower, but it's more of a matter of just the sustainability and a whole bunch of other factors that go into it. So it can be things like data collection, the physiology, like we've already described, that calories are your how much your body burns has come down significantly more there's so many factors that go into it so your weight loss is, weight loss hasn't stalled um but yeah you're just not able to achieve a consistent calorie deficit and consistency is the key piece here you know if you're only burning maybe half a pound per week you might not even realize and notice it and then you have a little bit extra on the weekend and you basically gain that half pound back so these are things that we need to kind of keep in mind but starvation mode definitely is not a thing so the big question is, is like, well, if I can't get into a calorie deficit consistently enough, is it, is it my fault? As I always say, when it comes to our managing our weight, it really isn't. There is so many things that go into not only our physiology, our metabolic rate, our appetite regulation, it is all so freaking complex. And again, as much as the IG influencers would like to make you think it's simple and they do provide simple messaging and things that make sense, on the surface, but ultimately it's it's just, you can't simplify it down into just a couple of different components or insulin being the reason or carbs being the reason. There is so much that is going on and we need to be mindful of that. And on top of that, we have a whole psychology behavioral aspect of things that drives a whole other piece of it that is, yeah, very, very problematic. So the slowing of our metabolism is not starvation mode. The reason why you can't lose weight is, is not your fault, it's your body fighting against you. So what is really happening is a, a concept or phenomenon that we call um, metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis. So adaptive thermogenesis is more what we'll see in the academic literature. Metabolic adaptation is more what's thrown around on by Instagram influencers and such like that. But basically, it is the change in energy expenditure following acute or long-term overfeeding and underfeeding, okay? So obviously, in obesity management, we're more focused on the underfeeding, looking at the calorie deficit component of things. And again, it could potentially be a barrier to uh, weight maintenance. It can be potentially a contributor to weight regain. We'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit here. But also, if you overfeed or overeat, your body will increase your metabolic rate in order to compensate for the extra calories. Now, for like 99% of us, um, it pretty much is minuscule. It doesn't really mean much because a lot of us will overeat and we definitely do not just not gain weight. But there is a few assholes out there that I'm sure we all know one or two of them that seem like they can eat anything that they want and they never gain a pound. We all know one. We've all heard of one. These are these individuals that their body just ramps up their metabolic engine to such a point that essentially the weight, the extra calories that they take in, they don't get converted to fat nearly as easily. So this whole metabolic adaptation of things really led us to what we call the set point or compensation theory. Now, this is the idea that each single individual <clears throat> has a predetermined set, waste, set weight based on genetics, environment, physiology, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now, predetermined means that yeah, you're 
your body is, this is the weight that when you get to a certain point, your body wants to stay at this weight. And so anytime you try to lose weight or anytime your calorie intake goes up or down or what have you, the body is going to defend or fight you and get you back to that predetermined set point because it's happy there. That's where everything is in balance. We feel good at this weight. We have enough energy. We don't feel like we're starving. We don't feel like we have too much weight. It's really nice. We, we, we quite enjoy it. So your body wants to constantly stay in this state of balance. And so it's kind of like a spring. And when you lose the weight, you go down, the weight wants you to come back up and vice versa the other way. But predetermined, and I'm sure many of you are kind of asking the question, it seems like my set point just keeps going up. And as you can kind of see, this is kind of the pattern. Again, it's that yo-yo dieting aspect where um, the individual loses some weight and becomes lighter and then ultimately regains the weight and then some, and this seems to be the new set point that they have to fight in order to get past. Again, they lose some weight with another diet or program and then they gain weight and their new set point seems to go up. And all of a sudden, this is the point that they need to fight to bring their weight down from. So if set point is predetermined, can it change? What exactly is going on here? So big question that we need to ask is, is metabolic adaptation due more to losing weight or being in a calorie deficit? Um, and yeah, how does that play out in terms of changing our set point? So overall, the evidence does say that the set point can change. We can go to a lower set point and even still, we're kind of now almost starting to, well, not really, there's still a lot of people that are really hung up on the set point, but in my opinion, the literature is moving in the direction where set point is no longer becoming relevant. And this is kind of where the question of the losing weight or the calorie deficit, what is actually going on here in terms of this metabolic adaptation, the shifting of your basal metabolic rate down. So let's start with the Biggest Loser study. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of the uh, Biggest Loser TV show that was out a number of years ago with uh, Jillian Michaels, which she just posted a new video that just made my mind blow the today. So I will you know, stay tuned for my social media channels where I just tear that one apart because God, that hurt my head. Um, but the Biggest Loser competition, um, they did a study around this competition a couple of years back and they found some very interesting results. Um, and this was the group right here. Kevin Hall was kind of one of the main researchers behind it. And Kevin Hall, he's huge in the obesity space, fantastic guy. Um, and yeah, some very, very interesting insights. And he's been a big contributor to kind of some of the data and stuff that we've pulled out. But what they saw in this study at The Biggest Loser was this idea of possibly persistent metabolic adaptation six years after The Biggest Loser competition. So what did they do? Well, they looked at 14 people that had obesity. All 14 of these individuals went through The Biggest Loser competition TV show, lost a ton of weight. And what they did is that immediately after the competition, they looked at their body composition, how many calories they were burning, all that wonderful stuff. And then six years later, they recruited them all back to the NIH metabolic chambers. And they basically had them live in these chambers that um, measure metabolic output and how much you're breathing and give you food and all that kind of stuff for a three-day period in order to remeasure and get all these body composition, comp composition measures again. So their hypothesis based on the current literature was that metabolic adaptation would still be present many years after the competition, and this would correlate to the amount of re weight regain. So at the time when this came out in 2017, so it's still relatively new, um, this idea that weight loss and then metabolic adaptation was, they, it was a belief that it was permanent, that when you lost weight, you essentially broke your metabolism and there was no recovering it, there was no getting it back. And this study kind of affirmed that. So what they found is, you can see body weight change here is that at 30 weeks, so this is right after the competition and in the minus numbers, all these individuals obviously lost weight. Some lost, you know, 20, 30, 40, over hundred kilos, some people lost. And then we looked at them six years later, vast majority of them, um, definitely they all gained weight back. Um, one outlier actually kind of lost weight. Um, and even then some of them even gained more weight than what they did at their starting point. Their fat-free mass change, so fat-free mass is your muscle mass, your bone, everything that is not fat, essentially, <clears throat> overall didn't change over the six-year period. And then the fat mass change, most of the weight that these individuals were gaining back does look like it was indeed fat. So they weren't gaining muscle over that period. They were gaining the fat that they had lost in the competition back over the six-year period. 
So um, at six year follow up, nearly regained some of the amount of the weight with some gaining all or more compared to the pre competition, and it was primarily fat mass. So what about their resting metabolic rate or their basal metabolic rate? Well, what we can see is that at 30 weeks, um, this was kind of where they were at. So the minus numbers, this was um, what, where, they, where they came down to, and this was compared to uh, the expected. So they basically took individuals that were the same age, height, and weight as they were at the end of the competition. And what they calculated for their basal metabolic rate, they compared it to that. And some of these individuals were upwards of minus 200 to minus 2,000 calories less than what their matched height, age, and weight control was at. And then six years later, they all gained that weight back. But as you can see, there was actually very little, there was no increase in their resting metabolic rate. For the most part, they all stayed the same. Their resting metabolic rate, despite gaining a ton of the weight back, stayed the same. So it never went back up to where it should be based again on the match age, weight, um, and height controls. And so we can see with the metabolic adaptation component, how much of it is actually going on. Um, and it's still even quite significant at the six year point out. So the conclusions, despite the weight regain over a six year period, it remains suppressed at the same average levels at the end of the weight loss competition. And the mean resting metabolic rates after six years was still 500 calories lower than expected. So we take our example earlier where the lady went down to 160 pounds and her, or her basal metabolic rate should be 1400. She would have been at a basal metabolic rate of 900 calories a day. So hugely, hugely adapted meta metabolism. Um, obviously that is going to cause some real issues in terms of trying to get into a calorie deficit and trying to manage your weight. And so they were still burning fewer calories than expected. And so this kind of led to the question of, well, this, this has to be permanent, especially from like the biggest loser, biggest loser competition, which was quite extreme, very low calories, um, high amounts of activity. So maybe the extreme end maybe played more into it, but nonetheless, this was a scary result and really struck a lot of fear in terms of obesity management because holy crap, there's nothing we can do about this. This is, this is permanent. Once you lose weight, you're done. You broke your metabolism. So um, this kind of seemed fitting and even for my day to day. Um, so set point can only go up if I lose my, if, if I, and if I lose weight, my metabolism is broken forever. So um, yeah, fuck this shit. But maybe not. Now, this was a really, really interesting paper. And this group, did they stir the pot? Um, it's quite funny. There's a lot of reviews and like tweets and stuff out there of this group right here, but this, this Katia Martin, these guys are based out of Norway and they collaborate with um, obviously uh, places in the US and Alabama and stuff like that. So they're really, really starting to stir the pot with some of the research that they're doing. Now this study just came out, I think it was 2020 um, that they did this research. Now, one of the big things that they got the most flack for was that they said metabolic adaptation is an illusion. They didn't technically say that it's an illusion and that it doesn't exist. They still acknowledge that it existed, but really the key point is that it's more of a negative energy balance. So being in a calorie deficit that is driving it and not necessarily the weight loss, but this illusion piece of it, like throw through a ton of people off and people got very, very upset about it, particularly a number of researchers that they have been studying this for this, their entire life. And for someone to come and say, what you've been studying for the last 40 years is actually an illusion. Yeah, it's probably going to chap some people and stuff like that, but um, it, was, it was quite funny to read some of the commentary. So I, I'm definitely watching these guys and this Martin's um, chick. I'm very, very much behind. She's a shit disturber. And so I can definitely get behind that as a, as a fellow shit disturber. But let's get into their study here. So what they did is they recruited participants from the AST ketosis and appetite suppression study. So this was already a larger weight loss ongoing trial. Now, the individuals that they pulled from the study we're about 18 to 65. So they're healthy men and women that had obesity. So their BMI based on height and weight and stuff like that was above 30. They were weight stable. So their weight wasn't changing. They weren't dieting. They weren't using medications or other supplements to help with weight loss. They were just living life essentially. Okay. And in the weight loss study, this is where calories in were less than calories out. The participants all got randomized to three different groups and each was following a thousand calorie per day diet. So quite a low calorie diet. And what they were trying to see here is um, with each group consuming a different amount of carbs, and they were looking at something for um, 
I think it was appetite suppression with ketones and all that kind of stuff. But there was different numbers of carbs between the three groups, but they were all on this thousand calorie per day diet in order to lose weight. So um, weight maintenance study. Now this was eight weeks afterwards, or yeah, they did the weight loss study for eight weeks and then they switched to the weight maintenance diet for four weeks. And this is where the calories in were gonna be equal to the calories out based on the calculations and what the resting metabolic rate and stuff was. And they did this for another four weeks and calorie intake, like I said, was, was based on uh, resting metabolic rate and their activity levels. And then after that, after the four week maintenance period, they went another nine months and continued on maintenance levels of calories. And so what this group did is they measured body composition before they measured it after the eight weeks, after the four weeks, and then again, they followed up at one year. And what did they find? So as you can see in the weight here, um, baseline, everyone was about 105 kilos or so. After the eight week period, uh, most people, it was about a 15 kilo or so drop week 13. So the four weeks, they were at maintenance levels of calories, no changes in weight whatsoever. And even at one year, there was only about maybe a five kilo gain after one year. Resting metabolic rate, um, here's the difference between the measured and the predicted. And I think I actually have a better slide that shows this. I do, okay. So average weight loss after the, four, after the eight weeks was 14.4 kilos, which is approximately um, 1.8 kg or approximately four pounds per week. So that's a lot of weight to be losing in an eight week period. So it was a very rapid weight loss, which makes sense. It was a thousand calorie per day diet. After four weeks at maintenance calories. So for everyone that's gonna get up in arms when I tell them to eat at maintenance level of calories, there was no weight gained. They did not gain any weight. And I think I actually even have a few people on here that I've talked to about going up to maintenance calories. This is the study that shows there is no weight gain over that maintenance period, okay? Fat mass even declined over the maintenance period by another 0.8 kilos and the fat-free mass increased. Now there might be some explanations with water absorbing muscle and all that kind of stuff, but nonetheless, there was another drop in fat mass over that four week maintenance period. Then after one year, there was a four kilo or about a nine pound weight regain, which after about nine months or a year really isn't too bad for something that was a restrictive over that eight week period. Um, resting metabolic rate, calculated and measured were equal at baseline as we would expect. And then at the end of eight weeks, we measured and it was 100 calories less than calculated. So again, we see that metabolic adaptation at work here. And then at the end of week four, after the maintenance period, so they were all eating maintenance levels of calories. What we see is that that metabolic adaptation was halved. All of a sudden it became only 50 calories after four weeks and 50 calories less than what we calculated it. So um, there was still some metabolic adaptation, but it was improved. And now, um, even then, the authors do state that that metabolic adaptation likely would have been completely gone, but the participants may have still been in a slight calorie deficit, ultimately creating um, that slight metabolic adaptation. Nonetheless, it was halved, and we definitely did not see that in the Biggest Loser study where they were still at you know, 500 calories less than what they were previously. These individuals were clearly reducing their metabolic adaptation. And then after one year, the metabolic adaptation disappeared. The calculated and measured resting metabolic rates were now equal, and there was no metabolic adaptation present, even though they did gain a little bit of that weight back. So what does this study tell us? It tells us that metabolic adaptation isn't permanent, and it may actually have more to do with the calorie deficit, so being in an energy negative energy balance versus the weight loss itself. Weight loss itself can still cause metabolic adaptation, but it looks like just being in that calorie deficit is more of the driver of metabolic adaptation. So it also doesn't seem to have as much influence on weight regain as we thought, because after four weeks, suddenly that metabolic adaptation is disappearing, it is going away. Um, so maybe it actually doesn't play that much of a role in us gaining the weight back down the road, particularly if our calories are going up. But how do we explain the biggest loser studies? This was six years. These people were, was it because they were more extreme? What exactly was going on? So a possible explanation from the biggest loser study is the idea of yo-yo dieting. So kind of a restrict binge cycle and the metabolic rate just never got a chance to fully recover. So as you can see, we have calorie intake is the little dots, the metabolic rate is the blue and weight is the red. So you go in a calorie deficit, calorie intake goes down, 
weight to metabolic rate all drop off and you kind of start increasing your calories again because you came off the diet or what have you. So calorie intake increased, um, but your metabolic rate was only starting to come back up and it was, you know, it was kind of up there, but not fully. And hey, your weight was up a little bit because you were eating more calories. And then you're like, oh my God, I need to lose weight again. So you drop your calories again, more significantly. Again, your metabolic rate drops, your weight does drop, it does come down. But again, the same cycle happens. And so suddenly your metabolic rate is considerably lower compared to your weight. And so this is one discrepancy, one area that potentially explains it is that knowing they didn't get any support post the competition and just knowing individuals that are struggling with obesity, especially in my practice, it's kind of this, yeah, restrict binge cycle that ultimately kind of goes on and likely their metabolic rate just never got a chance to properly recover. So it was permanently staying down because yeah, they were just going through the same cycle over and over again. So how might we approach this issue? And this is gonna be the, the big question, the big topic. And this is where I think we're gonna start seeing maybe the practice of weight management going in the future. Diet break or reverse dieting. So reverse dieting um, is basically where you diet for a period of time, whether it's eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever, and then you slowly increase your calorie intake over a period of weeks in order to increase your metabolic rate back up to where it is and basically to prevent weight regain. A diet break is basically where you diet for a period of time and then you immediately go up to your maintenance level of calories for two to 14 days. And basically the goal is again, not to gain weight or lose weight during this period. It's just to bring you to maintenance and help recover your metabolic rate and then go back into um, a calorie deficit. Now I will say a caution here. These are quickly getting picked up by the, um, uh, the IG influencers and social media and all that kind of stuff. And I suspect they're probably gonna be the next keto intermittent fasting fad. We're already kind of starting to see a lot around it. So definitely using caution if you're looking or working with somebody and they start talking about this stuff, making sure they actually know what the hell they're talking about. Because again, it has the potential to be kind of a fatty type thing. So this is reverse dieting. Um, again, you lose weight, your calorie intake goes down, but then you slowly increase your calorie intake and allow your metabolic rate to come back up where it is. And ultimately, you're able to keep your weight down. Now, I quickly want to show you this. This was the Matador study. This came out after the Biggest Loser study in 2018, I believe. And this was a really fascinating study that was using this concept of diet breaks. So 51 males all had obesity. They were healthy. They were randomized to two groups, either continuous energy restriction. So they just went on a calorie deficit for 16 full weeks. And group number two was an intermittent energy restriction for 16 weeks. And what they did here is they did eight times two week blocks and with seven times two week blocks at maintenance calories. So they'd go into a calorie deficit for two weeks and they'd go up to maintenance calories for two weeks and then down to a calorie deficit for two weeks and back up to maintenance calories. And they would cycle up and down, up and down, up and down until they got 16 weeks total of being in a calorie deficit compared to the other group. Both groups then completed a post weight loss energy balance phase for eight weeks. So again, they just went into weight maintenance phase again for, for eight weeks total. And then they did another follow-up six months later. And to note here, the calorie deficit that the authors created for the patients was they basically calculated their TDE, total daily expenditure, and then they created a 33% calorie deficit for these individuals during their calorie restriction phases. And what we found, so, the group that was doing this up and down, up and down, actually lost more weight after the 16 week period. And as you can see here, weight change during each block. So this is looking at the, um, the, the two weeks of calorie restriction, and then they go to energy maintenance, two weeks of calorie restriction, energy maintenance. And as you can also see here is that even in the calorie maintenance period, um, in these white bars here, in some cases, they were actually still losing weight. Again, going up to maintenance calories. I know a lot of you are probably being triggered by that and um, actually doesn't lead to weight gain until we start to get out to the end here. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. And as you can see here again, this is the weight loss over time. Now, one of the potential flaws of this study is that there might've been a miscalculation in the first couple of weeks in terms of what their calorie deficit should be for the intermittent group because the intermittent group lost quite a bit more right out the gate compared to just the straight up calorie restriction group. And that quite doesn't line up with just, again, physiology, energy in, energy out. 
So we suspect there might be something potentially going on here as a potential confounder, but nonetheless, the overall trend you can see is that they lost more weight and they kept the weight, the weight off six months later. So considerable difference between the two, looking at you know, minus 11-ish and minus three kilos or so after six months. So here's kind of the numbers written out for you guys. Um, overall weight loss, what they saw was minus 14 kilograms versus nine kilograms. Fat mass loss, um, 12 kilos in the intermittent energy restriction and eight kilos in the continuous fat-free mass. They lost a little bit more in terms of like muscle mass and stuff like that. And that might've been because of that initial extreme or more, um, more significant weight loss out the gate. So that could have been more something going on there. Again, that kind of points to maybe there was a miscalculation. Reduction in metabolic rate, the really cool part here. So what we saw is the people that did the intermittent energy restriction, there was only a 360 calorie difference. Whereas in the continuous energy group, there was a 749 calorie difference. Now that number is a little bit out and I'm, um, I might've actually typed that wrong, but nonetheless, there was still a significant difference between the two. So clearly what this is showing is that maybe um, you can not only get greater weight loss, but you can also get an attenuation or at least a reduction in metabolic adaptation with this cycling diet break aspect of things. So this was a very interesting study and um, very much is adding to a uh, coming pile of literature, which is really starting to change, I think, where obesity practice is going to be going. And again, the weight loss maintenance um, was greater, so there was more weight maintained or weight, more weight loss maintained with intermittent energy group compared to the continuous energy group, showing that maybe since we retained more of our metabolic or had less metabolic adaptation, that weight loss was, weight regain was less so. A few limitations of the study though that I do want to point out. This study did have a high dropout rate. Um, the intermittent energy group did see greater weight loss than expected, as I kind of mentioned. No activity was included, so I'd be very curious to see you know, if these people were doing lifting weights, and we have that comparison as well because we know uh, resistance exercise is so vitally important for maintaining lean body mass, and that's ultimately your main driver of your basal metabolic rate. Protein intake was also on the lower, in, lower side. Again, you guys all know how much of a protein fiend I am, um, and uh, people are eating protein, and so there was definitely that aspect where it was quite a lower protein intake. If we would have had more protein, maybe this would have further propagated the results and stuff like that. So a few things could have been optimized and obviously further research is needed, but nonetheless, this is still a pretty solid study. So overall, these are kind of my conclusions. Now, the literature is very much evolving and there's some people that have been in the space a lot longer than I have that don't really like where this is going, but I believe this is kind of where the future of things are going, looking at this concept of kind of diet breaks and that sort of thing. Um, I agree, it's not an illusion, but I think metabolic adaptation does play a smaller role than what we thought. And it is primarily due to the calorie deficit versus the weight loss itself of just losing weight. So some people have probably heard, eat more to lose more. Um, yeah, the 1200 calorie day diets don't work. If you're still on one of those, it doesn't work. These diet breaks and reverse dieting might be the future of obesity management in terms of not only is it going to physiologically help us with the metabolic adaptation, but having this quote unquote diet break may potentially help from the psychological aspect of things as well. And depending on how much weight we have to lose and that sort of thing, because if you're constantly in an energy restriction or an energy deficit, we know how hard that is. And that's why managing your weight in the long term is so challenging. And then finally, I think we're finally going to get to toss this set point theory. Um, I know a lot of people would not like me saying that, but this is kind of what I believe is, yeah, we're starting to see and tease out in the evidence. So how can you use this information? Well, by no means do I want you to kind of be thinking about this as like, oh, well, I need to eat at maintenance and then cut my calories severely, then eat at maintenance, cut my calories severely or anything like that, because that's, again, starting that restrict binge type of cycle. Really, there does need to be some thought and process around how many calories you are eating on a day-to-day -day basis and what you are kind of looking at for calorie restriction and stuff like that. It has to be reasonable. It has to be sustainable. Um, going up to maintenance is, yeah, being mindful that you are eating at maintenance, right? If you have a poor relationship with food and you've restricted for a long period of time, that might lead you to potentially binging on the other side when you go to your maintenance and ultimately causing weight gain. 
So being really mindful of that, it's not obviously going to work for everybody. And you need to make sure that um, psychologically, mental health, all those kinds of things are obviously optimized. And before you kind of venture down this kind of road. Nonetheless, what I recommend to everybody is try eating more calories. If you're doing 1200 calories a day and you're either not losing any weight or you're gaining weight, you probably need to eat more. Um, and that's what I think this really is helping us to tease out is that more calories likely need to be consumed in order to not only have kind of more of a healthy diet and lifestyle, which is the ultimate goal, but um, can potentially help with furthering weight loss and preventing some of that metabolic adaptation, which is a real problem if you're at 1200 calories a day. So um, that's kind of a few points on that. Obviously there's gonna be more, but um, here's quickly some of my references for you guys. So if you guys wanna go read those paper yourself, I forgot to add one of the other papers here. Um, I will add it to the YouTube video when I load it up there. But um, and another study that this Martin's group put out, like I said, watch these guys. There's gonna be some very, very interesting research and we're starting to see a slow tide and change. In fact, I'm thinking I'm one of the only um, people that's really in the obesity space that's kind of starting to utilize some of this. And so far I've seen pretty good success with a lot of my patients of just eating more and um, yeah, people having more energy, feeling better, all these great things. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens here. And um, yeah, I look forward to disturbing the shit if you will. Quick thing on the future events here. Um, how, how much am I supposed to eat for weight loss, calories and the protein, the king of the macronutrients. So this will be the next one. It is going to be October 20th, I believe. Um, exclusive event, probably going to be $5 a ticket there. So um, low entry fee. And I hope you guys can make it out to that. And um, yeah, that's going to be a good one. And then a couple other ones here are going to be, are my medications causing me to gain weight and exercise the not so holy grail of weight loss, all things exercise. We'll be talking about that. As always, guys, um, if you have any topics you want to hear about or have confusions around, and if it's a big enough one, I can definitely create a presentation around it. But if not, and it's smaller ones or you just have general questions, here's how you can get a hold of me. Um, my YouTube channel, Dr. Dan Dash Weight Loss Be Habit Mastery. I have a video that goes up there every week, and you can check those out. I talk about habits, I talk about the brain, I talk about medication. So definitely come and check it out and um, feel free to leave comments there. I usually do my best to reach out and to talk to everybody on there. My page, um, Dr. Dan Dash Healthcare Evolution. There is a group that I do have, HE Family with Dr. Dan. And then there's my email and my website. Um, sign up for my newsletter. You can go to my website and just wait for it to pop up. You can also get some information sheets on GLP-1, so Ozempic, Saxenda, and Contrave. And um, yeah, sign up for the email list and you get all the updates on what I'm doing and what's going on. And of course, check me out on Instagram and TikTok at the official Dr. Dan. So we will leave her at that and I will stop sharing my screen here and we will open it up to questions for everybody. Da, da, da. All right. Um, so should calorie restriction be limited to a specific amount of weeks before maintenance? If so, how many weeks should one remain in a calorie deficit and how long should the maintenance be before returning to a calorie deficit? Great question. So there is still a lot of back and forth on, um, uh, I guess this kind of where it's actually gonna go. And this is a big part where we need a little bit more research and data to kind of fully tease out what is the best approach. Um, there's one other trial out there, I think it was called the ice cap trial where they did like five days of a calorie deficit and then two days at, at calorie maintenance. And people didn't do too, too bad on that one. I don't think it was quite as effective and it seemed like the two days wasn't quite long enough. So generally the recommendation kind of right now seems to be anywhere from seven to 14 days. I'm generally recommending 14 days is kind of, I think the best way to go. And it's obviously your weight loss journey is gonna be longer, but ultimately it's a journey, right? And you wanna do this right and properly. So generally the period of, um, Calorie maintenance is usually about, yeah, a week to two weeks, I would say. I recommend two weeks. In terms of the calorie deficit period, how long you go for that? Again, that's going to vary person to person. What we do know from some of the literature is that if you are doing about eight weeks, that generally is probably about the max on a psychological aspect. If you go beyond eight weeks, it gets harder and harder to try and do any kind of calorie deficit and maintain any kind of, you know, more stricter parameters, if you will. Um, so definitely keeping that that mindful aspect to it. So it's going to vary and depending on you and kind of ultimately what works for you. And until we get more, um, more data and information, that's kind of where things are at. 
Um, I'm on Sexenda. I ate 1,250 calories per day for 10 months, lost 80 pounds, had major gallbladder issues, maintenance of 1,900 for a year, no Sexenda, started Sexenda again in June at 1,570, no loss at all. Could I really need 1,200 calories, even though we hear that is too low? I'm five feet tall, 230 pounds, 53 years of age. Yes, I'm sure that my tracking calories is accurate. So, um, Great question. And likely what's happening here as well is, um, I mean, your metabolic rate at 230 and, and five feet tall, I mean, you are a shorter lady and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm a, what we would probably want to want to look at is, yeah, what exactly is your total daily energy expenditure? What is your beta's metabolic rate? There's very few people, like it's generally very petite, very small, like under five foot women that maybe 1200 calories can be kind of their maintenance level. But generally 1200 calories is about the amount for a toddler. And so I would be kind of looking at just what your calorie intake is and trying to figure out and see what your maintenance would be. And I would write at your maintenance for a while potentially and see kind of what happens, um, particularly focusing on your protein and consuming um, more protein in that aspect. Uh, what do you define as eating more? Clients I followed who increased their intake resulted in weight gain. Would love to hear more about this concept. So eating more, um, and I'm a great question. So eating more, I kind of always define that as looking at increasing your protein. And for most individuals that I work with, it's more or less, we start with protein and we kind of focus on one meal, one snack, and we slowly start to increase it. What we want to have an idea of is kind of, yeah, what, what is their total daily expenditure that they're aiming for? And I also find a lot of people, when they start kind of increasing their calories, there's so much anxiety of just the thought of increasing your calories and going backwards and potentially gaining weight. There's always that potential risk that can happen when you go up to your maintenance. Like not everybody, most of the people didn't gain weight, but there still is that potential because some people did gain some weight. But just making sure that that idea around that is like, if you see a one or two kilo increase, that's okay. We're trending in the right direction. We're going where we want to be. If you're seeing dramatic increases in their weight, then they're likely going over that maintenance and they're likely going into more of a binging because they've been restricting for too long. So that's kind of generally the pattern that I see there. And so I tend to take um, kind of a slow harm reduction approach, increase slowly with the protein first, adding it, like I said, starting with one meal, one snack, what have you, and slowly but surely increasing it. And then, you know, start with breakfast and kind of increase from there and trying to work your way up to that maintenance level. Some people go right up to maintenance level, no problem. And it all kind of varies and depends. But what I find once we start increasing that protein, and we start taking that slower approach and getting closer to that maintenance level, suddenly actually weight loss starts happening again, which is interesting and counterintuitive. So I think it's a partly increasing it like that, but then also setting the appropriate expectations because yeah, any jump in the scale, and it might not even actually be a weight gain. It might be like water gain just because you're consuming more carbohydrates all of a sudden. And yeah, your body's going to hold more water and that's, that's okay. That's not actually fat. So setting the appropriate expectations around that as to like, there might be weight gain and that's, that's a possibility, but it doesn't mean we want to just snap and be like, it didn't work. So keeping that aspect in mind as well. Uh, da, da, da. Let me see, um, Boston in the pipeline. So I'm interested in the new uh, weight loss medications, the pipeline and how they differ from Wagovi, Ozempic and the like. Um, so there's not a heck of a lot of difference between the newer weight loss medications that are kind of coming down the pipe. A lot of them are being combined with say a GLP-1. Um, there's a couple other enzymes and satiety hormones that are going to be quite similar. Ultimately, all these drugs are doing is they are reducing, um, they're making it easier for you to choose the apple over the apple pie is the best way I can explain it. But essentially they're trying to reduce how many calories you consume on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the issues that I'm kind of bumping into right now is the idea that um, some of these drugs, I mean, we're, we're almost knocking people's calorie intake to, to almost none, which, yeah, okay, at 800 calories a day, you're going to lose weight for sure. But is that is that healthy on the other side of things? Like, are we pushing you too low? And particularly when some people get stacked with, you know, Saxenda and Contrave, 
now we're kind of running into some other issues and problems. And yeah, is our calorie intakes getting too low and causing some other issues and problems? And a potential area that I see with even bariatric surgery coming up as a potential debate point is that some individuals that are post-bariatric surgery, like they're so metabolically adapted, but yet they physically can't eat enough calories to try to go up to maintenance to try and correct this metabolic adaptation. So they're kind of stuck in this limbo of, yeah, like 500 calories a day that they need to consume. And at that point, there is no way you are getting enough nutrition to properly feed your body. So they're all going to kind of work similarly in the appetite regulatory pathways. Some people are going to work obviously very fantastic for, for some people that have dysregulation in those pathways and different pathways and such. Other people, not so much similar to Wagovian Ozempic, but they are getting more and more powerful and getting more and more effective. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of comes out. Um, I went back to school all night, so must drop off. Can't wait. Uh, ask good questions. Thanks, Dan. Glad you discussed the starvation mode notion. My question is, how does pharmacotherapy affect the components of TDE? So pharmacotherapy, the drugs and stuff like that, they essentially don't. Um, they don't have any effect on having you burn more calories. So increasing your metabolic rate, your basal metabolic rate, they don't affect any of the other components of your overall total daily energy expenditure. They are solely going to be affecting your calories that are going in. And so basically just reducing how much of that, how many calories you're able to consume and to take in. So that's exactly where they're acting. Some people will say the GLP ones do increase your heart rate by a beat or two, and that's increasing your metabolism. But any amount that is, is, is just minuscule and not noteworthy, I guess you could say. Um, is set point the same or different as a plateau? So not quite. Um, so a set point is kind of just where your body wants to maintain your weight. So whatever kind of weight you're at, I mean, you've all probably experienced that, you know, maybe it's 200 pounds that you lose 10 pounds, you come back up to the same 200, you lose 20 pounds, you're back up to the same 200. So that's just kind of the weight that your body just wants to hang out at. A plateau, on the other hand, is more where you're on a dietary, in a calorie deficit or whatever like that, you're losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, and suddenly you're not losing any more weight. Maybe it's a week, it's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. The weight loss has stopped. It's not going anywhere. And that would be what we'd consider a plateau. Now there's a difference between a plateau and what I call hitting the floor. A plateau means that we can break through it. We can make some changes and we can continue on. Hitting the floor means basically you can't make any more changes. Either your calories can't get any lower. You can't increase your activity level. You can't make any tweaks or changes or anything like that. Um, those are kind of the things that you need to be, uh, you just, that's, that is kind of what we call your best weight, the weight that you reach when you're living the healthiest lifestyle you possibly can that you honestly enjoy. Whereas a plateau, yeah, you can make some tweaks and changes and break through it. So it's more of a weight loss journey where the plateau and hitting the floor comes into account where a set point is just where your body wants to be, if you will. Um, I have spent thousands on weight loss education. This was the best event I've ever attended. Thank you for the thrill-based evidence education. Well, thank you. Wow, that's great to hear. Um, all right, back to this one. Our weight center organization is big on set point theory. What was the most condemning evidence that you believe it should be chucked? Great question. So with the set point theory, it's this idea that, yeah, your body continues to defend um, a particular weight. When it gets to that weight, it wants to defend, it wants to stay there. What I really found is that, yeah, when we start looking at um, this idea of losing weight, that your body wants to gain the weight back, it's not actually necessarily the case. It's actually more the case that your, your body is going to fight against you for as long as that you're in a calorie deficit. If you get rid of that calorie deficit, we see that metabolic adaptation and what that pull, that pull that people talk about, that was the thing that pulled people back up to their set point. So if we eliminate that metabolic adaptation, suddenly that pull to go back up to set point doesn't seem to really exist anymore. And you can actually potentially reset your set point if you can go into energy balance or an energy maintenance level. So that, that's kind of the biggest thing is that set point is based on this idea that it's your metabolic adaptation. When you lose the weight, metabolic adaptation kicks in to pull you back up to that set weight, but that's, that uh, metabolic adaptation can be seen to, we seem to be able to get rid of it 
if we can bring you to the maintenance level of calories and essentially ride you there. And that can be your new set point, whatever weight that is at that point in time. So that's kind of where I'm leaning towards and what I'm thinking as to why the set point is no longer really having its weight in its place anymore. It's just because, yeah, we're able to reset it and it's because of the calorie deficit versus the weight loss that the biggest loser studies seem to show and seem to present. So that's kind of that piece in that aspect of it. Again, the evidence is changing. There's some, this is all kind of new, very cutting edge stuff and has really not been picked up on the mainstream side of things, but it's very compelling and interesting as to where exactly it's going to go. So it's exciting. It's uh, a little bit different. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm, I'm putting my money at the moment. And I think the set point theory is um, not necessarily there. When we start looking at a breakdown of obesity and why people gain the weight back, metabolic adaptation is a small piece of it, not nearly as big as we thought it was, but there's more of this psychological behavioral component of things that's not being properly addressed and people reverting back to their old habits, old patterns, and old behaviors that ultimately is leading to the weight gain, not the metabolic adaptation and the physiological aspect per se. Hopefully that um, makes sense. What is the best way to calculate calorie maintenance? Um, I would just type in, go well, if you were to just type in TDEE calculator, on um, Google or whatever like that. There's a group called Precision Nutrition where I've taken some education and nutritional courses through. If you type in Precision Nutrition uh, TDE calculator and stuff like that, those are some really good evidence-based calculators and they give you a hell of a lot more information around it. And you can just go through, answer the questions um, or the CKD, it's called the, not CKD, Cadigo, the kidney, kidney something guidelines. If you were to type in like kidney, TDE calculator. Um, that's another really good one that you can just punch it all in. You can get your maintenance level of calories. The easy, quick, easy one that I always tell people to consider for a quick calculation to figure out not so much weight maintenance, but how many calories you should be eating for your actual weight management journey itself is to take your goal body weight and your goal body weight is what we would consider your lean body mass, but lean body mass is it's more conceptual than anything else. So goal body weight if you're 300 pounds and you want to be 200 pounds, take 200 pounds, your goal body weight, you times that by 12. And that's how many calories you should be getting actually closer to, to properly lose weight. And if you do that consistently, um, yeah, there's a very good chance that you actually will lose weight. In order to calculate your protein intake, you take your calorie or your goal body weight and you times it by one. So if it's 200 pounds, protein intake should be 200 grams of protein per day, or at least a target to aim for. So that also can give you a kind of a starting point. So goal body weight times 12 for your calories and goal body weight times one for your protein intake. Um, I like your recommendation on increasing protein intake gradually. Perhaps noticeable weight loss with increasing intake is a result of the higher thermic effect of protein. Absolutely, that is a great observation and yeah, that might also be the other piece that's kind of going on there because when you look at the thermic effect of protein, it requires about 30% more energy um, or 30% of the protein energy intake that you take in. It just consider it uses significantly more and that's another reason why protein is king. Protein, if there's a macronutrient that you need to take in, it is protein. So it's what I always talk about. It's a lot easier to get more protein in than what people think. Um, it's just a matter of making it the focus of your meals, but increasing it slowly. Start with the protein. It's also very hard for your body to take protein and convert it to fats and carbohydrates and to store it as fat. So it's just protein. Protein's king overall. It, it can be can be awesome in that sense of it. And so that's where I find a lot of one of the big slips ups that people have. So fantastic observation. And I would definitely agree with you. Um, is it okay to reach out to you in email as I process all this information? So much information equals um, mighty processing now. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's ever any questions, shoot me a message on social media, email, what have you. Email, I'm a little bit slower to respond to. And even social media now, I'm getting a bit overwhelmed with it. But if you ever have any questions or want me to cover a topic or what have you, reach out on one of my channels there. I will do my best to get back to you at some point in time. And if I don't right away, or it's been a week or two, send me a reminder email. I get tons and tons of notifications and messages every single day, plus on top of running a business, working a full-time job and working other jobs and consulting and stuff like that. So feel free to reach out and um, yeah, just pester me and I will, I don't get offended. I don't get mad. I'm, 
I'm here to answer questions. And if you have a burning one, I am happy to provide you the best evidence um, based answer that I possibly can. So um, any other questions from anybody? Clear as mud. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Um, and if you guys have any feedback or anything like that on the presentation, the way it was given, anything like that, please feel free to forward that or kind of forward along a form as well. And yeah, any, any insight is greatly, greatly appreciated. As always, we will be having another event. I believe it's October 20th. Um, you'll get the date and stuff like that as it comes up. And um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys can, can come and join us then. So if that is it, um, I will talk to everybody later. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. You guys are awesome. All right, everybody. Have yourself a wonderful night.